So to give you an idea of how different the Bible can sound, we're going to read first from the King James Version, then from the Message Version by Eugene Patterson, and then finally from the New Revised Standard Version, which is what we usually read from. So I would like to invite our first reader forward. This version is from the Message Bible. Um, <clears throat> when the Feast of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. 
Without warning, there was a sound like a strong wind, gale force. No one could tell where it came from. It filled the whole building. Then, like a wildfire, the Holy Spirit spread through the ranks. And they started speaking in a number of different languages as the Spirit prompted them. There were many Jews staying in Jerusalem just then, devout programs from all over the world. When they heard the sound, they came on the run. And when they heard one after another with er, their own mother tongues being spoken, they were thunderstruck. They couldn't, for the life of them, figure out what was going on and kept saying, aren't these all Galileans? How come we're hearing them in our various mother tongues? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, er, visitors from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Perithia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, immigrants from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, even Cretans and Arabs. They're speaking our languages, describing God's mighty works. Their heads were spinning. They couldn't make head nor tail of any of it. They talked back and forth, confused. What's going on here? Others joked. They're drunk on cheap wine. Peter spoke up. That's when Peter stood up and, backed by the other eleven, spoke out with bold urgency. Fellow Jews, all of you who are visiting Jerusalem, listen carefully and get this story straight. These people aren't drunk, as some of you suspect. They haven't had time to get drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is what the prophet Joel announced would happen. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions, your old men dream dreams. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. I'll set wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black and the moon blood red before the day of the Lord arrived, and the day tremendous and marvelous, and whoever calls out for help to me, God will be saved. And now, finally, from the New Revised Standard Version. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them. And a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one, of, each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But the other sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. 
But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoking mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, I would sure like to have another Pentecost like that one, wouldn't you? That'd be kind of cool. I mean, wouldn't it make this whole faith journey thing a whole lot easier if we could just have one big blast of the Holy Spirit with wind and fire and, and then the ability to speak in different languages? What do you suppose people would think if we were to run out into the streets all of a sudden and start speaking a bunch of different languages? Would they wonder how much communion wine we had been drinking? Or would they think that we're some sort of a crazy cult that you want to steer clear of? That first Pentecost was over the top. Of course, we've heard the story so many times that we're not surprised by it. But when you start comparing it with Christianity today, it's like apples and oranges, and one can't help but wonder, how did we get from there to here? If things like that happened back then, why don't they happen anymore? And how would we handle it if something like that did happen? I've given you those little paper cutouts of flames, and we have orange and red balloons and paper streamers to reenact the story, but what if the Holy Spirit were to actually come crashing through that door like a tornado and real flames were to suddenly appear over all of our heads? Would we say, oh, there's the Holy Spirit? Or would we run like heck through the basement and call 911? <laughs> According to the Bible, big things happened in the early church. In fact, that very same day the Holy Spirit showed up, the church expanded from 130 people to 3,000. The Spirit of God rushed in and empowered people to do something that was beyond belief. They began to communicate effectively with each other. Bridges were built and crossed in an instant, providing a glimpse into just how great the power of God really is. Underneath the differences of nationality and language, a fundamental unity was exposed, and in a matter of moments, everything changed. There was no going back. Christianity had become an overnight sensation. But it wasn't the signs and the wonders that captured the hearts. The signs and the wonders may have captured everyone's attention, but it was what happened next that made things stick. Following on the heels of the signs and the wonders, people were questioning, what does this mean? And that was when Peter stepped up and began to do a little biblical exegesis. He held the present experience up to the light of biblical text. He used a passage from the prophet Joel to help explain what it all meant. He didn't quote the text verbatim. He made some tweaks so that they would fit and be more meaningful for the current occasion. In other words, he adapted Joel's old words to speak to new circumstances. Now, my theory is that big doses of the Holy Spirit were probably short circuits. 
Small infusions are necessary from time to time. But who could realistically hang out with a tornado for very long? All week long, I've been trying to put this text together with what is going on today in our congregation. Yesterday, it finally happened, when we took a confirmation class to Cincinnati to explore and to walk the labyrinth. There are actually two labyrinths to walk. One is indoors and one is outdoors. The day was windy and cold, so we spent more time walking the indoor labyrinth, and um, I'm kind of glad it worked out that way. The labyrinth is a path of prayer. It's a spiritual tool to help us become closer to God. The twists and the turns are a metaphor for our own individual spiritual journeys. There are times when we feel far from our center, far from our destination, far from God. At times we wonder if we're even on the right path. But when we do reach the center, we become aware of the divinity within all of God's creation. The path leading out from the center returns us to the daily challenges that God created for us. As I walked the labyrinth with the others, I couldn't help but see it not only as a metaphor for my own spiritual journey, but also for those walking with me. Sometimes we would pass each other as we walked. Sometimes we would find ourselves behind each other. Sometimes we even walked side by side for a bit. It wasn't hard to open that metaphor up even further and realize that we're all walking this same spiritual path together. Everyone here in this congregation is walking a spiritual path both individually and together. Sometimes we pass each other. Sometimes we walk side by side. But we are all on the path seeking the center, seeking awareness of the divinity within all of God's creation. Part of walking the labyrinth is navigating the twists and the turns. Sometimes you feel as though you're never going to reach that center. And when everyone else has made it there ahead of you, it becomes pretty <coughs> tempting to just cut across and skip right straight to the center. But then you ask yourself, what would be the point of that? The experience would have no meaning without the twists and the turns. So it made me realize that big spiritual demonstrations, while exciting, are actually shortcuts. The signs and wonders and miracles got everyone's attention on that first Pentecost, but it was the question, what does it mean, that was the whole point of the operation. Peter's interpretation of the present moment through the lens of Scripture was an example that we still follow today. I'm not at all sure that we can handle big spiritual demonstrations. The problem with a faith built on miracles is that you keep needing bigger and better miracles to sustain it. But we do need small instances of the spirit in the life of our congregation to shake us up. We need twists and turns that make us wonder if we're ever going to reach that center. A freshening of our faith begins with disorientation. We are often our most open to God and God's world when something has happened to wake us up, to open us up, to cause us to question the ways that we put the world together and explain life and our identities to ourselves. The Spirit helps us to name the inward hopes, desires, and longings that attend anyone who is waiting for God's redemption. The pain of creation can seem so great, and the coming of God's redemption so far away. But then, all of a sudden, there is the Spirit intervening, interrupting, interceding, and helping us to give voice to our deepest needs. But if we don't follow up with that critical question, what does this mean? 
how are we to receive a new orientation? Hopefully, by now, you've had enough inspiration to answer the question that I put to you when we handed out our flame cutouts. What am I seeking as I walk the road of faith? As we go into our community conversation, I would like for you to think about a couple of other questions. First, how do you interpret moments in your life through the lens of scripture? Second, what amazing but confounding things do you see God doing in the life of our church that makes you wonder, what does this mean? And finally, how can we better balance our reaching out in service and prophetic witness while nurturing within our congregation a vibrant and spiritual life? My friends, we have been joined by our baptism into a community of faith that waits for the Holy Spirit to come along and shake things up. As we ask the age-old question together, what does this mean? We prepare and we equip ourselves to share the disruptive and life-giving word of a God who will not rest until all people enjoy an abundant life. May it be so. Amen.